Support for this episode comes from you. If you love this podcast and want to help us make more, consider supporting us by visiting patreon.com slash let's give a damn. That's patreon.com slash let's give a damn. We are very grateful for the group of damn good people that have already chosen to partner with us. You, my friends, could be next. Thank you so much for considering. After doing our, our programs, what we realized, many of those communities didn't have dentists at all. So we designed a fellowship program to train local women in those communities as community health or care professionals I love it. to provide basic care within their own communities. That's so amazing. those women will not only uh, help in reducing those uh, and bringing access to care, but also they will get paid, you know, which provide economic yeah, opportunities jobs. for them. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. My name is Nick Lapara, and on this show, you'll meet amazing damn givers, and you'll find the hope and the tools to give more dams than ever before. My guest today is Jean-Paul Laurent. I probably messed up that French accent. Some of you will let me know if I did, but that was my humble attempt. And don't worry, Jean-Paul will reintroduce himself once we begin our conversation. Jean-Paul was born in Haiti and came to the United States in 2004 with a dream and a desire to change the world and do something much bigger than himself. He found out what that thing was after he returned to Haiti in the aftermath of the devastating 2010 earthquake that decimated so much of the country of Haiti and took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in a matter of just a few seconds. As a result of spending time with his people and his home country in the aftermath of that tragedy, the Unspoken Smiles Foundation was born. An organization that envisions a world where every single human has access to great dental care. Jean-Paul and I met in New York City a few weeks ago to record this conversation at their office in Fidei in Manhattan. You're going to love this guy, I know it. He is such a sweet human with a deep passion that I think so many of you are going to identify with. Are you ready, friends? Okay, cool, because I am as well. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Jean-Paul, founder of the Unspoken Smiles Foundation. Let's go. Jean-Paul, welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today. It's a great honor to be here and tell my story well, on this I'm, amazing podcast. I am honored. Um, and I said this before the podcast started, I was going to let you share your full name because I cannot get that French accent down. So what is your full name? <laughs> Jean-Paul Laurent. I like, I just like how it sounds. So I need you to, I needed, I needed you to say that. Thank, Thank you so much for being here. We're at your office in New York right? We were just talking about how it's not a bad place to be. We're near uh, uh, one, what do they call that thing? Financial district? Yes. We're in the, we're in FIDI, but like, what's uh, the, the world one, one tower, one. Oh, uh, the World Trade Center. Yeah. World but Center. there's a, there's a name. What is it? One world tower or something like that. Yes. One. So there, there's that also th we have uh, across the street from us. It's uh, the New York Stock Exchange. Yep. yep. And then we have the Raging Bull right in front of our building there. I was very happy to see that coming up, but the little the girl's gone. Yes, the the girl is actually back in front of the New York Stock Exchange right now. Oh, okay, yeah. maybe that's even better. Yeah. You all know what I'm talking about. You've seen the pictures of you know the bull, and then the little girl standing in front of it, super defiantly. I love. Right. Yeah, I've seen it the last few times I've been here, and then I walked up just now and. It wasn't there. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear she's still around <laughs> and being defiant. That's right. That um, was quite a powerful statement. Uh, very uh, powerful. Yeah. 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 So anyway, you have an amazing location for your office and people don't even know what you do yet. I'm so excited to get into that. Before we get into your work and why you're in New York doing this work and CGIU and you're a UN uh, consultant and all right. this stuff, right. let's hear some of the beginnings, right? So tell me your story, anything that you... Uh, want to tell me. We'll mm -hmm. listen. We, we want to hear from you. And also anything that will help us sort of pick up on why you're doing the work that you're doing now, you know, because I think so many times in our stories, you can pick up on, oh, that's why he's doing that. That's why she's doing that. That makes that's total right. sense. And so mm -hmm. tell us as much as you want. Yes, absolutely. I, I was born and raised in Haiti. Uh, as many of, of you guys know, uh, is considered one of the poorest uh, countries in the Americas. 
and possibly the world. Maybe the world, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so in growing up there was was everything I know. So while most people think about it uh, this way, it was the greatest country for me because mm. I had never traveled anywhere. It was you know, your country. It was my country. It was the only thing I knew. And um, so my I, I have a pretty nice upbringing there. Uh, not many, like... Not many people could say the same, but I, uh, my, my dad was a school principal, and um, and I grew up uh, in Catholic school, old boys' schools, uh, as primary and also during high school, and um, so I have a family of four, and um, it, it was it was a very fun country. But uh, at a very young age, I was already exposed to to violence. Because uh, I was born during the area of Duvalier, the um, the sun, and during that time, within the first two years, that's when he was leaving Haiti, and I was uh, probably like two years old at, at that time, mm. and then do, from there, that's when the violence started. Because after he left, it was total chaos. So I was already exposed to a lot of those violence and brutal uh, dictatorship of uh, the military at that time. So. And um, so now, growing up, I, I realized that how what what many people may think it's a disadvantage is kind in a way an advantage for me because it it kind of make me very strong and resilient. Absolutely. And that's when the when the, that term comes in when people are talking about Haitians being resilient. Uh, it's because of uh, all those things that we have to endure at a very young age, whether it's hunger whether it's a violence, whether it's uh, all the kind of things that you can imagine. So we, we experience it sometimes uh, in our life in Haiti. Yeah, and so you were there from birth until uh, 15 years ago, right? Yeah, so what? The, so h- how and why did you guys uh, come to the U.S.? Or was it just you or did your whole family come? Yes, actually it was an interesting way because um, I was uh, going to turn 21 when I was invited to to come to the U.S., so what happened? My uncle who lived here filed a petition for my dad years ago, like more than twenty years ago. And that year that we came in was actually the year that they they invited us to come in. So I left Haiti with uh, with my green card. On hand. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, and this is one of the good thing because yes. I didn't get to experience so many things that people are experiencing here when they come in without papers. So it was like uh, really uh, an exciting thing for me to to experience. At the same time, it wasn't something that I had planned because I was in the middle of my college year and had to leave um, everything behind. And, and, and sadly, during that time, it was the time where President R.C. needed to leave the country also. So we had also like a political instability yeah. right around the time that I had to, to leave the country. So, and, um, But, you know, my, my dad had four siblings, so all of them benefited, plus the, the children and the wife. So in total, it was 17 of us together. Amazing. Who came the that's, same year. That's wild. Yeah. So now that you've been here for a good chunk of your life, uh, 15 years, you know, you're stateside for 15 years. Right. What do you, you know, you talked about how you're so fortunate to have had the upbringing you had. And e- even with all the, you know, the crazy shit and the right. instability, <laughs> like you're still fortunate. Like what, what are some of those things that you still look back on? very fondly, you know, because you ha- are here, you know, in America, the promised land, right? And I yeah. don't believe it is that. But for so many coming in, it's like right. way better than what they came from. Right. But you're talking very fondly of growing up. I- I've talked to other people that have immigrated here uh, for for work and for refuge for all sorts of reasons. Mm-hmm. And they don't ever want, you know, they don't think fondly of that time and place in their lives. Right. Um, what are a couple of those things for you? Well, again, like most people uh, will, will not, so cause that's why I don't put it generally because my experience growing up in Haiti is totally different than many people. Sure. It's not to say that I didn't experience uh, some hurdles where we had to work miles and miles to go to school and wake up like three o'clock in the morning to, to wait in line to get on the bus to get to school at 7 a.m. And if you miss uh, miss that 7 a.m. opening door, you get to send home 
you you, you mm. actually lose the entire day. So I, I, I in, seven a.m. seven a.m. for classes, like yeah. And um, I experienced all those things, but again, uh, compared to other people who had nothing at all, mm. and I cannot relate to them, and I know how they feel because I, I, I have some friends, classmates, who had parents who had nothing, but still managed to get them to private school and to give them a better life. So, um, and I think uh, the education that I received in Haiti in that school was the, the best, some of the best that I've ever had. So which in a sense kind of helped me because when I got into college here, there was a lot of things that I was doing, I already knew. That's amazing. I was yeah, even things that I learned from high school. And then um, in my adult life in Haiti, I started ballroom dancing uh, also, which kind of helped me here because when I moved here, I, I went to NYU and started competing for NYU I ended up being the uh, number third uh, in the U.S. Uh, it's incredible. For, yeah. For, so it's just so funny about the you know the conversation around immigrants and refugees coming, right? Because I don't want to get. I'm going to make a statement, a factual statement. I'm not trying right. to get political here, but our president wants to convince the vast majority of Americans that the people coming in only want from us and they're going to be a burden because they're whatever they're rapists they're murderers they're dumb they're stupid they're less than they're not as educated as we are he speaks these words all the time he says these things right and uh, so i grew up in guatemala oh, i i wasn't born there but my dad is from there we moved back there so i i grew up all the meaningful years growing up were spent mm -hmm. in guatemala i loved it i wouldn't trade it for the world that's right but all of my friends in Guatemala, which is a third world country. It's beautiful and it's amazing, yeah. but it's still a third world country. It's not first world by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And all of my friends knew at least, like fluently, at least two or three languages, some of them five and six and seven. I had a friend there, she literally knew seven languages fluently. And she was, you know, 16, 17 years old. Her parents took them all over the world and they mm -hmm. spent summers here and there. And so this notion that Oh, if you're coming in here, you're automatically going to be behind because there's no way that you could get an amazing education in Haiti of all places right. and then come here and, and compete. You know, you're, you're coming here and you already know this stuff, yeah. right? <laughs> you could maybe teach the class or at least assist in teaching the class. Exactly. And so I love hearing that because I want people to hear that. I want people to hear that, you know, just because like bad shit happens in Haiti, right? And there's, right. you know, that earthquake that devastated, oh you know, Haiti. God, and yeah. like, just because those things happen there and they might not have the infrastructure to respond well, or, you know, they're they're not mm -hmm. as economically sound and stable as we are. And we're not because we're $22 trillion in debt. Right. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that the quality of people coming out aren't amazing, spectacular, and we need to treat them as such. Yeah, Because absolutely. kids here don't know more than one language. They can barely <laughs> speak the one they know, honestly. I mean, there's just yeah. grammar error after grammar error, yes, right, with these yes. English-only speakers. Right. And then they get mad and say, like, why are you coming over here? And it's like, you know, you're like, they know way more about the world and about language than, oh God, than you yes, do, than you could absolutely. ever do because you stayed in your same state your whole life. Or, yes. you know, you go to the same vacation spot. You don't ever want to meet people outside of your bubble. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's a rabbit trail. But it's a meaningful rabbit trail because I think people need to be reminded of that. When people come, America was, once she became more welcoming, right? We came here on bad terms and did a lot of crazy shit that we shouldn't have done. But right. once we, you know, once the Statue of Liberty was in place and we were saying, welcome, come, like, yeah. come because we know that you're going to make us better. Right. We need you here. I mean, mm -hmm. the diversity of New York is mind blowing. Oh my God, yes. Right? Certainly. This should be every city. I wish it yeah. were every city where you could, <laughs> like the richness of, of, uh, diversity here. the diversity yeah. here anyway yeah. so that's awesome that you share that because i love you affirming that and oh, hammering absolutely. that yeah um, it's good for people to understand that and and me per personally uh i was a well-grounded young man when i moved here you know whether it's uh uh to education or, or skills i had anything that i with me to to prepare me for for any country around the world and in fact united states wasn't my primary country to come to um interesting yeah what, what so, was the first pick so my first pick was actually dominican republic and i that's why i was i spoke uh, spanish fluently and i still can read and write uh fluently, but when i moved here i didn't speak english at all 
This is wow. so much so that I wasn't yeah. prepared to, to be here. I was more interested in Spanish. And I learned English when I moved here. You know, in fact, I was yeah. in the same class with my dad, learning basic English with him. How to say, today is sunny, like basic grammar with, uh, at Bosis in West Nyack. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. So bridge the gap. I want to get to um, the work that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but bridge the gap between finishing college and when you started uh, Unspoken Smiles Foundation. So what happened in there that led you? What were the steps that led you to start this organization? Yeah, absolutely. So when I moved here uh, in 2004, so as I said, I had um, it was like one of the most difficult time for me in my life because I had to adjust to a new culture, to a new environment with no friends, no language, and everything like that. So it was uh, kind of tough for me. And it was the weather was also a little cold when I moved here. Uh, yeah, like I imagine. March, yeah. Um, so I was a, a little bit sad uh, because I first I didn't get to say goodbye to the friends that I share my entire part of my adult life with in, in Haiti. Um, then, but you know, so I, I was determined to take advantage of this opportunity also. Yeah. Because I was like, man, I'm in this great country. I'm going to get as much as I can and give back to the people in my country. So that was always in my mind when I land my uh, my, my foot in this country. Then, um, so I, I went to Boses uh, to learn English for about a year. So I, 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 I work really hard. I, I ask the teachers to every three months uh, if they can test me to see my level of English so that they can move me to the next class because I wanted to be prepared for, to, for college. So they saw how determined I was to, to learn. I asked them to give me extra work to become uh, uh, more skilled in, in, in my writing. So I, I did just that, you know. So every time I take the test, I pass them. They move me to the next class. I work hard, I work hard, and work hard until I finish uh, uh, the, those level within a year, which most people finish within two years. And, wow. And, yeah. And and most of them also who didn't finish high school receive uh, get to to spend an extra time to get the GED uh, yep. license. So because I already graduated high school in Haiti, so I was ready to go. And um, so from there, I transferred to Rockland Community College in 2005. Um, and then I spent two years there. Um, and then I, after that two years, I transferred to NYU College of Dentistry to start a career in de- as a dentist. So, but you where know, did that desire come from? So I it started in Haiti. In Haiti, I was always uh, interested in the medical field, okay. but you know, I just didn't know exactly which branch of the medical f- uh, field I should go. But uh, I think I saw, like, uh, during my last semester at uh, RCC, I started looking, explore some opportunities, and then the dentistry came came to mind. And because I already had an associate degree. And NYU was the only school that had a degree in uh, a bachelor in dental hygiene. So I was like, let me uh, go and get that degree Mm -hmm. because as a minority, you know, it would be difficult to get into dental school. So by getting in the school and get that degree, I'll make some connections and tell people how much I want to get to dental school. So maybe that way will that will help me get into dental school after that. But while I was getting that degree, uh, in in 2010, the earthquake happened in Haiti. So, so I was like devastated, obviously, because yeah. uh, uh, I saw like everyone was uh, going to to help Haiti as a citizen. I, I felt the urge to do something. I just I didn't have the money. I didn't have anything else. Uh, the skills that I learned at school was the only thing that I could uh, could do. So I decided to to make a trip to Haiti independent trip i contacted some friends who were dentists and my boss and asked them like to give me that those time to to make a trip to haiti and they they kindly offered the supports to do that and when i traveled to haiti i was uh, i visited a camp near my brother's house uh, in petionville and uh, i'm telling you this is the first time i returned to haiti since i left 
And that was the first time also I saw the level of poverty. Mm. Because when I was there, I didn't uh, see see all those, uh, the, the real poverty there until I come here and I see how people are living. I see electricity 24 hours yep. a day. Yep. You can water's eat. always running. The water's always yep. running. You can drink whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. Um, and, I, and mind you, as after one month, I started working. So I, I was already uh, getting uh, money. Meanwhile, people spend their entire life in Haiti and cannot uh, get started. So it was like uh, something, uh, an experience that really opened my mind in terms of uh, the poverty and how people are living in Haiti. And uh, so that's when I was like, uh, those things sort of uh, working in my mind to, to figure out a way to, to, to help those people. And um, so the, the, the welcome that I saw uh, that I got from those uh, children at the camp because I initially came for for the children, but you know the entire people from the camp like invaded me and and say hey I need some help too look at me so like even adult patients so we we ended up seeing about a thousand people and um, so on my way back I asked God to really guide me to in terms of the next level of what I can do to really help these people because I didn't want it to be a one-time thing. And um, so when I returned here and started thinking about what is the best way to help those people, and I was like, maybe uh, launching a foundation and getting support from other people would be the best way to to do it. And uh, so around that time, there came uh, an opportunity to, to, for the resolution project which I competed, which uh, it's an organization that uh, that sponsors young leaders and give them uh, uh, seed funding and opportunities to to launch their venture. So I traveled to to Boston at Harvard University and competed for the first time ever in my life in front of a panel of judges to to receive that uh, that, that uh, fellowship. Did you get it? Using that uh, experience in Haiti. And of course, I, I won that. And it was like the first time I had people believing in me. And, That's cool. And, and with, even with my broken English, uh, people really took care of my passion to help those people in terms of the, of the dental needs. And it was like a very specific organization. And idea also was uh, that also make it more appealing to the judges. So after winning that, I really been like, wow, maybe that's uh, that's somewhere, something that I, I should take seriously. So at that point, you weren't thinking about starting a company yet, no, you no, know, an organization. No, no. It was just a project. Yes, exactly. But when you got all that feedback, you're like, maybe this is bigger than just exactly. a project. So that, that was when I said, man, that's that, that could be something big. And after winning that, uh, and what makes it more, uh, more meaningful is because... I didn't have also the skill to to launch a, a company, and uh, so during that time, I decided to that I, I don't want to continue to dental school. I finished my degree in dental hygiene and I got my bachelor in health service administration. So when I realized what I wanted to do to launch the organization, and that's when I got my master's at Columbia University in uh, in management, nonprofit management. So. Mm -hmm. That's super special. Uh, right. Before we get into exactly what you all are doing, um, and we'll spend a good chunk of time there because I think it's it's super incredible and there's a lot that I don't know, so I want to get to know it here right. on behalf of everyone listening. But let's go back a few minutes because you mm -hmm. you talked about going back and people like swarming you, right? Here's what I want to tease out for a second. Um, I talk with a lot of the guests that I have on are white people going into third world uh, countries and peoples. And the biggest thing they struggle with is this white savior complex, right? Yeah. Like it's the white man again, coming in and saving the day or seemingly cause they're not, you know, right. But so many times what they bring is more hurtful, you know, than actually it's more harmful than good. Yeah. But I talk with so many amazing people on my show and that's the biggest like common struggle. There's a lot of white people for mm -hmm. to, not to paint too much of a broad stroke, but it is, you know, starting their organizations and we're going to charge forward. We're going to fix this shit, right? Like we're yeah. going to do this, but you are, you're black and more importantly, you're Haitian yeah. going back to your people. 
Yes, right? That, yeah. You could have easily, because I, I, again, I think part of this American mentality, especially the kind of Trump MAGA sort of people, they right. think you all are coming here just to take, yeah. right? The idea yeah. they have is you come, you're, you struck it rich, you got here, you got your green card. You don't have to fight years for that like so many yes. other people. Mm -hmm. You're just going to take and take and take, right? You're just going to, you know, live for yourself and build your little thing here. Yeah. And that was never on your mind, evidently. I'm seeing the timeline. It's right. like, no, you come here. I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed. Work hard. And then the opportunity presents itself to go to serve the people back home. Absolutely. Right? I mean, I, th that was like a very good way to put it because, um, again, in my mind, if I told you that's what I wanted to do today, I, I could have been lying, you know, yeah. because my goal was to, to go to dental school and make a good life for myself and, and God knows do whatever I want. But uh, that situation like really changed my life, you know, in my perspective on how I see people and treat people and more importantly, how we do uh, our charity work because yes. uh, it was important for me is not to say, hey, here's some toothbrush, here's some, uh, some things. Yeah, those the story became a part of who I am, you know, because I I see myself as being one of those kids who could have been uh, unlucky to uh, and be part of a victim of the earthquake, you know. In fact, my my father's school was totally destroyed, and I, I see mm. every time I go to those places and other communities, I see myself in those people. And, uh, and that's what makes makes it more meaningful to me. And I think uh, you, you really touch a good point in there where uh, we oftentimes uh, black Haitians or black leaders who travel to do good often don't receive the same credit as the, those white people 100%. or any other, just because of the of the color. because racism and racism, because of sy yeah. systemic yeah. injustices for sure exactly. yeah yeah i'll say it for you because i'm latino right. but i'm i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm lighter than you are so i'll just yeah right. it's true i mean i have a lot of friends who are black and who are doing amazing stuff in the world and i see how much men and women more women obviously yeah. but like how much harder they have to fight for the same thing oh my God. that yeah. the white guy the white girl just walks in and yeah. just says i'm doing this thing and everybody's like yes, yes that's so yes, cool that's true um I said a story. I saw a story. This is kind of maybe symbolic of maybe the fight that you have had in front of you. This guy um, tweeted yesterday that he he and this black guy were standing on a corner hailing a taxi right here in New York. Right. And uh, he didn't put up his hand because this guy in front of him was there first, so he's gonna let him get a cab first. Right. This guy had his arm out, and this cab after cab just like kept going, kept going. Wow. And so this guy turns around and I assume sarcastically, but truthfully looked at this this guy that I follow who is white and said, hey, can you use your white privilege to hail me a cab? Oh and he said God. it sarcastically, but then the guy um, put his arm out and in three seconds, somebody pulled over and he let the guy in the cab and off oh he my went. God. That is just symbolic of, I'm sure yeah. the struggle, you're not a black American, you weren't a black American either, you're a black Haitian that came to America. I'm sure that has been part of the story, has it? Yeah, of that, course, that, that absolutely. Struggle and that I fight. mean, like the moment people see Jean Paul Laurent, yeah. they automatically yeah, put that, me in a category. I don't even that's need another to thing. Black Haitian, and then with the French, like you know, <laughs> connection or whatever, like that might exactly. turn some people off. Exactly. Yeah. I don't need to say anything or go to follow up. The name only give it up. Yeah. And also because the the issue that I'm tackling is such a unique issue Very. and one of the most overlooked health problems in the world. People don't often make the connection between the oral health and the uh, the general health, so th therefore they always like uh, shift it towards other other issues rather than this one. But you know, it, it's a combination of all those issues that makes it more challenging for me uh, to doing that. But you know, I, I'm determined to fight, and and once you true to yourself, you 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 fight for the right cause. Uh, everything else will come into place at the right time. So um, I, I strongly believe that. Yeah, so Unspoken Smiles Foundation, the potential reach of the work that you do is 500 million people, right? Because oh. there's 486 million children currently living with untreated tooth decay, right? Right. And we don't think about this as people living in a first world, people that, you know, I'm not saying everybody, you know, there's probably a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck, but you have toothbrushes, toothpaste, you have soap. You don't work, think about tooth decay, Right. But as I was just thinking about it, as I was like prepping to go in my mind just to like ask more about what you're doing, I'm thinking 
damn, like if your mouth isn't well, <laughs> that's going to affect everything. everything. If your mm -hmm. teeth hurt, if you have cavities, if you if things are rotting, that that pain, that discomfort is going to affect your whole entire everything. life. So um, tell us what you do and how you do it. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, to put it into perspective, like we have to see uh, the global vision uh, issue. So worldwide, there are 3.58 billion people who are affected by oral disease. Mm -hmm. So that's according to the World Health Organization. That's nearly half, that's the, half world the population. That's half the population of the world. Yes. And then, and as you know, if you think about it, as the population start to grow, there's going to be more teeth, right? And so there's going to be the need for those teeth to be taken care of. So this is not an issue that's going to be going away anytime no. soon. And so like for children, for instance, we got 486 million children who are currently living with untreated tooth decay. So meaning that two or more teeth has existing infections on them. Wow. You know, and what, what we wanted to do. So that's why we designed the program because we, I, I studied the field very well and I, I, I traveled the world to do some outreach programs. So typically what they, anyone in the, in, in the field of dentistry will do, it will be treatment. So, oh, do you have a cavities? Let's treat that and then send you home. So that's the only thing. That's currently what how do you do, do you solve this problem right now? Our approach is totally different because we tackle the root cause of the issue. At the same time, create economic opportunities for young women, and uh, in a way that help bridge the huge gap between dentists and the population currently. So the first program that we have is a school-based program we decided to do a school because in school you can reach a large number of children all at once and we will be able to measure the impact of the program to the years as the children goes to the next and next and next class. They constantly will learn about the same thing. Mm. And in that way, we take surveys from the beginning and the end of the year to, to measure the impact of the program has on the, on the behavior of those children because our focus is on education, prevention, and behavior, behavior change, not so much on treatment. Because I can treat a tooth today, three, six months later, that same tooth can develop another sure. cavity. Yeah, which and is also, probably what's happening with most of these other organizations, right? They drop <laughs> in, they do the checkup, they treat the cavity, hand them a toothbrush, but right. it, whatever situation they came from, they're going mm -hmm. right back there because exactly. you didn't look at anything that's happening over here, right. another cavity in just a few months. Good. And then the other issue with that is like traveling, bringing dental care to another country, bringing dentists doesn't really solve the problem. Oftentimes it creates more harm, not just How to so? the people, but also to the community. I'll tell you why. Yeah. So if you travel to a community like there's a tooth that have like a cavities and that could easily be treated here with a filling because you don't have the equipment the right equipment the only thing that people most of them do take out the tooth so now you have beautiful young kids growing up missing half of the permanent teeth when which there have, wasn't a reason to actually take the teeth out. <laughs> exactly, and which has other secondary effects in the uh, in the the way they eat, oh, the, sure. the diet, the, the yeah. We need all of our teeth to bite the you know <laughs> certain things the right way, and if and half of them are missing, exactly. And people cannot afford to put implants, dentures, and all those kind of things. So uh, while the, the 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 they may want to do good, oftentimes they ended up doing more harms. And the other aspect of that is. Uh, Charity kills local jobs for communities, mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. So you have in uh, uh, underserved countries where dentists study very hard to, to earn a degree in dentistry. And then after they graduate, there's no job for them because people are relying on free charity care from an international organization rather than get seeking treatments from local dentists. People oftentimes wait year long to get free treatments. And that way, the, the level of infections end up growing much bigger because they, had to, they wanted to wait for that free care. So which is another way we're solving this issue also. 
because we don't travel with dentists from U.S. to those communities. We put all our resources towards the local dentists and the local communities. Yeah, they're already there. They're already there. They yeah. have the knowledge. Why not put give them the equipment, give them the resources to take care of their own population? And and so far, th- this model works really well for them. They loved it, and we get like great feedback for our, from our current our country representatives because of that. This happens and, a lot, doesn't it? Um, I know many teams of doctors of all kinds of doctors that you know they take fifteen or twenty of them, yeah, over somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. And I bet more times than not, right? Some some places they might genuinely need a doctor because no one's around. But I bet right. more times than not, they have the doctor. They just don't have the doctor, the doctors, but they don't have the resources. The you know some we could bring other things to the, you know to put at their disposal. Right. We don't need to bring our. We don't always need to bring our expertise there. Exactly. Right. I mean that's 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 very good way, a good way to put it because you know dentists from other countries den- dentistry is an exact science, so whatever you learn yeah. from Venezuela or Guatemala, yeah, mouth is a mouth is a mouth. It's yeah, a, it's the same yep. thing that you're gonna learn anywhere. You know yep. that's why when dentist the only difference is the the recognitions from a U.S. degree to versus the the third world degree. So. But it's totally the same thing. So for me, it didn't make sense to, to, to bring dentists and spend a lot of money on tickets and, and to travel with those dentists while those funds and resources could be uh, spent towards the local dentists, and it's, which is more sustainable because they will stay within those communities. And then, so because, you know, traveling for seven days or 10 days or 15 days doesn't really solve a, a, no. a lifetime crisis. No. You know, you have to create a sustainable model where day after day, months after months, weeks after weeks, year after year, people can get access to basic care, which is why our approach is very unique and different. I love it. Thanks. I want to talk a little bit about you being a part of CGIU, and I have a bunch of connection with the team there, with Chelsea, yeah. and I've interviewed a bunch of people. I also want to talk about what the heck a United Nations consultant is, <laughs> you know, what do you do with uh, the UN. But before we get there, I want to get as much of Unspoken out. I want people to go and, you know, look and observe what you're doing and get involved if possible. So when right. did you, like, how many years in are you? And what's the grand vision? Like, right. what, what, I mean, I'm sure every day is a struggle. I know nonprofit world very well. I was in it for 14 years. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, you feel probably a lot of days like you're begging, borrowing, and stealing from everybody, yes, you know, I money know. from here to put there and all the stuff. I get it. Yep. But, like, what's the, if you could, you know, rub the lamp and get the genie out and say, this is where I want this thing to go, like, what do you foresee happening? I mean, the big goal is to really get access to dental care for people in underserved communities around the world. You know, that's my bold vision is to equip each communities with their own uh, dental care professionals so that way they can get routine cares uh, on a regular basis. Um, and at the same time, that will reduce uh, or eradicate uh, dental disease around the world. So that's the bold vision for, for me. And All right, yeah. Real quickly, are, you know, as you're going to these different places, are you only working in areas that already have specialists that you can leave in place? Or do you guys have a mechanism for actually training someone if you go somewhere and there's like, there's nobody here, right? <laughs> Ideally, there are dentists already there and probably in most cases there are, but some places are just not going to have, you know, any hygiene care specialists, right? Mm-hmm. So do you guys train? Yes, that's exactly our model because, you know, when we go to a community, first of all, the school model is uh, the most success- sustainable model to date. Because the, the moment those school those children, we belong there. So it's uh, it's a matter of uh, raising the right uh, capital to scale the program beyond the pilot programs we started already started in eight countries yep. around the world. So now, after doing the uh, programs, what we realized many of those communities didn't have dentists at all. So we designed a fellowship program to train local women in those communities as community health or care professionals I love it. to provide basic care within their own communities. That's so amazing. those women will not only 
uh, help in reducing those uh, and bringing access to care, but also they will get paid, you know, which provide economic yes, opportunities jobs. for them, jobs and the career opportunities in dentistry. And if, if for any case they want to pursue a higher level of, of a degree to become a dentist, we created a pipeline for them to facilitate that, whether to get them to dental school at NYU College of Dentistry, which, which we're working a partnership right now That's awesome. with the dean, and also or the dental school that we can provide. So uh, this this is like a very uh, exciting opportunity to, for women empowerment and, and skills building, and which uh, in alignment with the UN Sustainable De- Development Goals, yes. which is how I became a consultant because... Uh, Within the first four years, we became a partner of the ECOSOC, which is one of the major UN pillar program, uh, the economic and social program of the UN, and also the Department of uh, Global Communication also. Yeah, so in that partnership, um, well, actually before this, what I'm going to test you. You yep. said you're already working in eight countries. What, what, uh, which countries are you already yes, in? Yes, so we are currently in India, Romania, El Salvador, Guatemala, um, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and U.S. It's beautiful. Yes. I love it. Those are. Thanks. I've been to almost. I was gonna say I've been to all those countries, but oh, I also haven't. Iraq. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Have you been there? Not yet. Okay. So we're planning a trip there soon. That's awesome. Because the time that I was going there, like the U.S. Uh, State Department uh, said, said you no, can't. They say everybody needs to return. Uh, from U.S. Uh, citizen needs to return and not travel there. So that's why I was looking at the, the place. But uh, Kurdistan region is usually like a safe uh, area. Yep. Uh, Iraq is mostly like the most uh, challenging one. Yeah. But you have to go to Iraq in order to get to Kurdistan. I have friends in Iraq that I want to introduce you to oh, that are doing great. wonderful work great. there. Yeah. Okay, so in your United Nations role, what, is that, what does that look like? What do you get to do? As an organization, we are an NGO affiliated with the United Nations, ECOSOC, and the Global Department yep. of Communications. So our, uh, what we do is we provide uh, uh, advice, expert advice uh, for the SDGs and all the other programs to the UN through our program. Okay, cool. So whatever information we collect to our organization that can add value to the UN goals, then that's when we set up meetings either to the high-level political forums or the UN General Assembly or any other ECOSOC events. So we get special requests to uh, oftentimes give all presentation or written uh, reports to them so that can be included in the annual reports for, for them. That's awesome. Yeah. So you actually get to like speak into really incredible conversations. Absolutely, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. And you're also part of uh, CGIU. So the people that faithfully listen to this podcast know that we've had multiple guests on. Chelsea's been on twice. Um, Love the work that CGIU is doing. How did you get connected with them? Um, And then we just kind of put two and two together that you were actually speaking at last year's event. I was there at the event, um, but I didn't didn't get to speak with you at that point. Uh, But you were speaking on stage with, you know, the Clintons right behind you and a a, a couple thousand kids right in front of you. So, yeah, what's been your involvement with CGIU? Yes, I started. What have you given to them and what have they given to you? Like, what's that look like? Sure. I first applied to CGIU after winning the the Resolution Fellowship. So I was like excited. Oh, I'm going to win everything. Everybody believed in me. So I was like so excited. I applied to CGIU that the, the next year, then I got rejected. So I was, I got crushed. I was like, oh, oh man, yeah. after winning something big and then you get turned down. You thought you were so, going to start getting them all. <laughs> exactly. So and then, um, so and then the following year in 2015, I was like, you know, I reapplied again and I got in. So I was like, yes. So that's when I understood that it, within this field, there's going to be yes and no's. And the most important Lots of rejection. thing, exactly, is to put up and try again, and come come and ask for feedback about what went wrong, so that we can present a better project. So this was the first example of uh, what I needed to learn uh, with uh, how t- I needed to deal with rejection from a major organization. So which turned out to be great. Yeah. Because in two th- 2015, um, I got there as a commitment maker. The following year. Uh, 2016, I, I I was a campus rep for, for Columbia University um, for CGIU. 
the 2017, uh, I, I was invited to speak at, uh, in Boston uh, during the uh, lightning uh, cer uh, ceremony, during the opening uh, round. Um, that was a very exciting experience also mm. where President Bill Clinton had to introduce us. And um, it, it was a great opportunity to, to, to do that. And, and that year, I also served as a mentor for over like uh, 50 uh, commitment makers. And That's then, cool. Yeah. And then the following year, it was like I got, I received one of the highest uh, awards within CGIU, which is the honor roll, uh, which was awarded to probably like 10 to 13 uh, alumni uh, of CGIU. So that's when you, uh, you were there also. Um, and then my involvement with them so continued to the day as an ambassador where we get to to put uh, strategic uh, initiatives for, for CGIU moving forward in terms of uh, what we can bring to make it more exciting, to help other uh, commitment makers, the new ones and the current ones. So it's a network of over 10,000 uh, alumni and it, it's very exciting. That's beautiful. I've talked with, at this point, many people who have been involved in CGIU and everyone gives it glowing reviews. Like that's very yeah. rare yeah. Um, that you'd be part of an organization where everybody that I've talked to, which is dozens now at this point that have been a part of it in some way and nobody's forcing them to say good yeah. things about it and yeah. they are. They just feel really like equipped and helped and they were, they were supported, um, whether as a commitment maker or they took on a bigger role. So that's Absolutely. cool. Absolutely, yeah. That's I mean, cool. it's it's it, they have one some of the most uh, incredible people that we work with. You know, Megan, Alex. So, and and I think uh, it's one of the organizations that truly puts uh, the the young leaders first. You know, and they they constantly learning and, and trying to to make uh, to find new ways and better ways to make make it more exciting for you for you and for me spe specifically I i'm very close with the team there you know if, if you go to the clinton um, headquarters right now you you'll see my face on the annual reports so it's just like those opportunities that yeah. came for me and that kind of boosted my profile and the organization's profile in front of the big donors and the CGI networks and partners, yeah. then that kind of really helped me um, uh, in a big, major way. And that's why I'm a kind of person that that's uh, very grateful and always remember people who helped me. And that's why my involvement with them continues uh, as I gain more knowledge, more resources that I can share with that's other beautiful. team. So I constantly do that with them. So your work is great. Proud of you. Thank you. Let's get practical for a couple of minutes as we begin to wrap up. I want so you are a young uh, entrepreneur uh, in the craziest city in the world, um, <laughs> and you're trying to and, and you're tackling a problem that is one out of every eight people or whatever one out of every sixteen people in the world. Like that's a big problem, right? Yeah. And you have your hands full until the day that you die, if yeah. if you choose, right? So this is yeah. a big thing. You're in a big city doing a big thing. The people listening, I think they're listening because not because they want to hear a great story mm -hmm. only. They want to be equipped to go give a damn. They okay. want to be equipped to find out what their thing is and say, I want to tackle it like Jean-Paul did, right? right? And so teach us for a minute. How do you take care of yourself to, again, this can be as practical as you want to make it. How do you take care of yourself so that um, you can uh, be in this for the long haul. So that you're here 40 years from now, just <laughs> still kicking ass and taking names. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to do is to really find um, other people, good people that can surround yourself with good people that can help you get there. Because there's no way in anyone can do something this big by themselves. There's yeah. no way. So for me, even though the story started with my experience uh, in, at, at the earthquake, yep. it, it became much bigger than myself to the point that it's not about me anymore. And that's how we were able to, to launch this program to other countries because for, it would have been very difficult for me to go to a country that I don't speak the language, I don't know the culture, I don't know what's happening, but because... 
I put, I empowered other people to take action. We were able to expand uh, to globally, and mm. that's our vision to continue to do that. And that l- kind of put uh, lift a big uh, weight over my shoulder by uh, re- uh, giving responsibilities to other people because it's not an issue that affects uh, people in the U.S. or me, rich, poor. It, it's something that affects everyone. Yeah, and it's it's something that is hundred percent preventable uh, because. Again, everyone ha- has a toothbrush, everyone has toothpaste, but we're still having the same issue. Yep. So which makes you think that it's not the, the tools that, that's the problem. It's how you use them that's, that's creating the yep, problem. Yep, yep. And, um, and that's, that's my vision, to, to take care of yourself and also give other people the, the opportunity to grow with you. Uh, and um, and then know that if you don't know something, it's okay to not know everything. You know, yeah. it's just like seek help. And I'm I'm very I'm someone who's very honest about the things that I know and don't know. Uh, I seek help in in many ways. Yeah, that's a good yeah. segue into what I wanted to ask next, which is let's stay practical. Mm-hmm. What were you actually? What were you not good at? Rather that you needed help with as you were as you ha- you had this big vision, you saw the right. problem. You, you started to envision solutions, but you it seems like you also had the self-awareness to know I'm not good at these things. So what yeah. were you good at that you could do? And then what were you not good at that you yes. needed help with? Because I think just getting practical help yeah. people, because I, I know I'm in that space. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I've had several really close friends, my wife, my mentors, like the biggest thing they hound me about is get you a team, like build a team, find people. And I'm not avoiding it. I love mm-hmm. collaboration. I'm, yeah. uh, I mean, I have a very strong personality and I, I know where we need to go. I'm the vision person, but there are a million things that I can't do well that are taking me 10 times as long because I'm doing them yeah. like taxes, <laughs> like all the, like yeah. the financial part, the operations part. Like I just want to go, I just want to do yeah, exactly. somebody take care of all this. So mm-hmm. I'm beginning to get way more serious about like, I need to get a team, you like, know? Exactly. So, so yeah. help us, help me. Well, the thing that I wasn't good at first was uh, I was very bad at finance. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have a good estimate of how much um, the programs will cost per person, per school, per country. So You were just guessing. I was just guessing yeah. about all those things. and um, But, you know, what I was really good at is leveraging free resources that were available to me as a student to get the program off the ground. So whether it's to build a partnership with the United Nations, which many big organizations couldn't do, but we did it within two or three years mm. of, of, of existence. Yeah. And also we built partnership with uh, Thompson Reuters uh, uh, Foundation, which provided legal advice to us in any countries around the world for free. So things that could have cost us ten over ten thousand dollars in in legal fees, we get access to it till this day for free of charge. And also in terms of getting dental supplies, toothbrush, toothpaste, uh, uh, all those equipments that needed to to launch a, a, a project, we get them for free from to a partnership with American Dental Association and Henry Shine, who provided all those things. We also had a partnership with Columbia University, who provide paid internship for us. So we have interns working with us. And they get paid through Columbia University. So you're good at networking, partnerships, collecting friends, maintaining those relationships. You needed help, and that that that's you're you're mirroring my story, yeah. <laughs> where I don't I can meet anyone I need to. Yeah, um, I've built enough things and built a, like an awesome enough network, and a lot of that is just serendipity and things I didn't do; it just happened. Right. But either way, I have a network and I have the ability to build these partnerships. Mm-hmm. What I, what I, and prob- it sounds like you, like the operations, the finance stuff. Exactly. Like that is a unique type of person that Absolutely. doesn't want the spotlight. They're so good at, you know, getting things in order, creating processes, creating exactly. systems. And that's just not how my brain thinks. I just want to <laughs> go a hundred miles an hour and meet all the people and yep. keep those relationships going and please 
life pay me to do that you know exactly i mean i'm i'm the big idea kind of guy yep. you know so i have you know me like i have this idea that i want to do so what i needed to know and i wasn't good at finding is someone to say hey that's great but how are you gonna pay for it you know yeah. and also someone with uh, with uh, a legal advisor say hey uh, if we do this what are the uh the pros and cons about this so I was like uh, one person trying to do everything at yep. once and, yep. and not having the financial background to raise the right amount of money to scale the program beyond what it is now. Because f frankly, for what we do, there's tons of funding available for what we do, whether it's to uh, work with children and, and women empowerment, to build or young leaders programs. All those areas are very specific areas that have tons of funding that yep. we can explore but in order to do that we needed the right people and the right writing skills to 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 write grants to to receive those funds which i didn't have at that time so let's move on to the last question i mean i could talk with you forever we'll we'll <laughs> do this you. we'll do this again sometime this is super fun right but um let's wrap this up for the sake of people trying to get this done in one or two commutes right um someday you're going to die hopefully many, many years from now. But death is inevitable. It's coming for us. Five minutes from now, 60 years from now, we don't know. Right. In this scenario, I get to give your eulogy. So your family, your friends, the people that you affected through Unspoken Smiles Foundation, um, the people from the UN, the CGIU, they're all there to honor and mourn your right. life. What do you hope that I would say on that day about your life and legacy? I think... Uh this is a guy who used smile to help solve one of the most overlooked health problems in the world. And I think the, the power of smiling is like so powerful that I want to see this problem being solved during my lifetime. But if I don't get to do it, I think uh, having someone to talk about how this guy who, who smiles 99% of the time ended up spreading that message to to children every corner of the earth and and make positive change in their life i mean smiling is uh we don't think about it but it's well yeah we don't think about it typically but it's so powerful right Absolutely. i mean especially in a city like this right you can walk around and see <laughs> most people just yeah they're laser focused they're on too. getting where they need to go yeah they've got a book in there you know if they're sitting on the train they're definitely not smiling you know yeah. they're you got a book in their face or they're listening to music and everybody just kind of like tolerates each other, right? right. I move here, this person sits down, stands up. But if if I go outside right now, which I'm going to do it, you know, I'm just yeah. going to think consciously on the way to my next thing, like just smile more. Yeah. Because if I walk by somebody and, they, and I smile at them, 99% chance they're going to smile back. They don't know why, but I was smiled at and that made me happy. So you're yeah. getting a smile back. They're not going to ignore. I mean, there might be some miser out there that does, but... Typically, you're going to get a smile back. And that's a really beautiful, this is beautiful work because we want everybody to experience a healthy uh, right. smile. We, we, we talk out of here, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the words that we say and the work that we create, the friendships we build, most of it happens with our mouth. Yeah, it's the portal of entry to anything good and bad. Yeah, that's for <laughs> yeah. damn sure. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, a lot of bad stuff can come out of here as well. Yeah, but exactly. life, I mean... Whether you're religious or not, people that read the Bible, like the tongue yeah. can be a fire, right? The Christian Bible says it can be a fire. It can exactly. kill, it can yeah. hurt, or it can bring life. Yeah, and whether or food that you put in there too. Yeah, yeah also, it is the portal for like, yeah, all <laughs> exactly. the... Exactly, yeah. so that's why I said that. And because as as someone who's trained in the field, there, there are many diseases that can be spot early in the mouth. So I can just take a look in your mouth and see something, whether it's early uh, or cancer or HIV or diabetes, there's, there's just a swab. There's many things that, we, that can be spot early and can save people's life if they are trained to, to recognize those signs and symptoms. And I think um, many people cannot smile because they have like some personal issues whether they want to or not, there's many things that affect them, but everyone has the ability to do it. Yeah. 
And if we can find ways to trigger that through our programs, whether seeing uh, the, the people that smiles from different countries, uh, if we can tr trigger those positive messages to smile, I think uh, it can help a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Where can people find you? Well, they can find you. I'll just say it because you have a very memorable handle. The <laughs> mayor, of, just mayor of the smile. Mayor of smile. Mayor of smile. So that's, right. that's on all social media. Yes. Can, yeah. So that's all the social media. Um, MySpace? No, probably not. <laughs> but all the all the real social media. Um, <laughs> mayor of smile. Where can they find out more about your organization? And 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 do you have a call for action? Question. Yes, absolutely. So uh, they can find us at unspokensmilesfoundation.org. Or find me uh, on every platform as um, Mayor of Smile. And uh, so we also now launch a very important program, which is the Leadership Council membership, which uh, provide additional resources and, um, uh, and opportunities for young people in the 20s and 30s to join us uh, as a junior board member. And I think uh, this program is the most exciting one for us because uh, it's not a program that that asks people to just donate money. Because I see many organizations that that has, keep asking people, "Give me a donation, give me a donation," and send out thank you le uh, letters after they receive that. So for us, we wanted to try something different, yeah. you know. And I think uh, the leadership council membership does exactly that. So it's a three-way benefits where the members benefit something, the, the beneficiary that people we serve benefits also, and us as an organization, we also benefit. And a good example is we had um, someone who came uh, from India, uh, a young lady who graduated uh, from Harvard University, who wanted to, to, to find something to, to get involved. And so that's when we opened the opportunities for them to join the Leadership Council membership. And to that program, they ended up giving to a network. Uh, we connected them to, uh, to, to school where they ended up going to, for another degree in pediatric dentistry. Amazing. And then they, she got published on Huffington Post. And we created a story for for our, own, our platform that elevated her status as a young dentist, and then continue like countless of other people we help to our resources because over the years I've built so many resources for the organization, and it didn't make sense for me to to have people who believed in me who supported financially or anything else and not use those resources to help them back. Yep. So that's why we created this uh, membership program to invite other people from different sectors, whether you're a lawyer, you, you're an educator, teacher, whatever your background, if you feel the need to, to give back, you join this membership and then we invest our resources in you. That's really beautiful. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Jean-Paul, for joining us here today. I'll put all those links and everything in the show notes. You're awesome. Keep going. And uh, we'll keep in touch with each other. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Let's give a damn about all health. And uh, thanks for the listeners. And it was a great opportunity to be here. I love it. Thank you. Friends, thank you so much for joining me and us for this conversation today with the incredible Jean-Paul. So much to learn from him. Please follow him on Instagram at Mayor of Smile and follow his organization at Unspoken Smiles. And if you want to partner with them in any way, visit unspokensmilesfoundation.org. As always, you can find links and more information about this podcast conversation and all things Let's Give a Damn by going to letsgiveadam.com. If you love what we're doing on this show, please tell a friend, leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, or as we open the podcast, consider giving us a few dollars each month to support the production of this show by going to patreon.com slash let's give a damn right now. You giving us uh, a few dollars, what you would spend on one cup of coffee each month helps us tremendously. This podcast episode was created by Chad Snavely and yours truly. The music is by our friend and fellow Damn Giver Propaganda. And next week, we have an amazing conversation with the incredible Shane Claiborne coming to you. I can't wait to spend time with you next week. Love y'all. Peace. Peace.